As a paramedic, I help in life-threatening situations. Seizures, drownings, babies on the way, or who stopped breathing. It's my passion. In an emergency, I'm here for you. And this is how you treat me. Up to 95% of our healthcare workers have experienced verbal or physical assault. No matter what the situation, it's never okay. It's always hard watching that, isn't it? It uh, certainly is never okay. But uh, welcome everyone today to what is the last day of what has been a, a really successful health and safety month for WorkSafe Victoria. And what a turnout. Absolutely fantastic to see everybody here today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name is Cameron Ling and I am fortunate enough to be one of the co-ambassadors of Health and Safety Month for WorkSafe Victoria and it's a role that is in its second year for me and I am absolutely loving the role because of, uh, well, a little bit of personal stuff with my family. My father was involved in a workplace accident but also seeing what WorkSafe does to make people safe within their own workplaces, whether as employer, employee, doing everything they can to make sure people get home to the people who are most important to them and, uh, and get on with the things that they love doing. Um, still, as we know, too many people get injured and, and sadly, even worse, die uh, in workplaces right across Victoria, right across Australia. So this Health and Safety Month uh, is a really important month for WorkSafe and all the people at WorkSafe. So it's great to see everybody here today. Before we begin, and I do introduce our first two speakers of the morning. I've just got a little, couple of little housekeeping things to run through. A call out to all the social media users out there, and I'm sure there is plenty, everybody's on social media in the audience. Please be part of the online conversation. Hashtag HSMonth for all your pictures, all your conversations, and more importantly at this event, all of your questions, because at the end of Claire and Catherine's talks, we're going to have some time for some questions, and that's going to be via the social media, the hash, hashtag HSMonth, or for those not on social media, you can text in some questions. The phone number will be on your screen very, very shortly, I do hope, because I didn't memorise it, which is very poor of me. Uh, <laughs> it'll come up soon, I promise. But please do jump on the, uh, on the social media, send in the questions, once that phone number does come up, text in any questions you have, because there it is, perfect timing, 0429 117 085, how couldn't I have remembered that, silly of me. Ask the questions, at the end of the, uh, the talks as I said, we'll be firing questions at both Claire and Catherine for anything that you want to ask. Please, if you haven't already, turn your mobile phones on to silent, vibrate or off, so as to not interrupt uh, the speakers while they're speaking. And we're always about health and safety here. So in the event of an emergency, the venue and the venue staff will direct us to the nearest evacuation assembly area. But to start off this event, which, as I said, is the last event of Health and Safety Month, month which started all the way back on Wednesday, 4th of October, with the Business Leaders Breakfast here in Melbourne. Been right throughout Victoria, plenty of regional visits, lots of important stuff and a particular focus this year on mental health and mental well-being in the workplace. And I'm sure both Claire and Catherine will take you through a little bit of that. But Claire is going to take us a, to a bit of a glimpse into the future of health and safety and workers' compensation in Victoria. Chief Executive Claire Amies will share Strategy 2030, highlighting the challenges we face and how WorkSafe will transform into a prevention-led, customer-focused and digitally-enabled service organisations. And one of those challenges is the projected rise in mental injuries and WorkSafe Health and Safety Month Ambassador, co-ambassador, as I said before, Catherine McClements will share her experience with the Art Centre Melbourne's The Wellbeing Collective, a collaborative program to address mental health in the entertainment industry. So, enough from me, because you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from me, these two right now. Can I first of all introduce the Chief Executive of WorkSafe Victoria, Claire Amies. Claire? Well, it's um, fantastic to be here, and particularly, as Cameron said, this is the end of a pretty big month, I have to say, across Victoria. 
Um, before I start, though, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting here today, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present, and for any elders from Indigenous communities who may be here with us today. And it's true, it's the conclusion of Health and Safety Month, and it is a significant part of our calendar um, at WorkSafe. And in fact, it's actually been the 25th staging of Health and Safety Month. Previously, Health and Safety Week, but I absolutely can assure you that the Health and Safety Month will be part of our future. So in the last month, we've had seminars and discussions right across Victoria, so in 23 locations both metropolitan and regional Victoria, ranging from Port Ferry to Mildura, Shepparton to Morwell, Geelong to Chadston, and many other locations. And it has been a fantastic opportunity to get together and hear from industry experts who are really leading the way in occupational health and safety, but also many of us, including some of you in the room, who are actually working hard in terms of understanding how to actually respond to some of those risks and hazards in workplaces that we've been trying to deal with for many years and continue to enable our colleagues to have a healthy and safe experience at work. So it has been a success for us this month, and we count that in terms of the feedback that you give us, but importantly, we've had over 4,000 people register to attend Health and Safety Month events. And by the end of today, there will have been 91 presentations delivered across Victoria. And the topics have ranged right across all topics we could think of, and particularly what you actually said you were interested in hearing about. So we've talked about young worker safety, international perspectives on health and safety, what to expect during a health and safety inspection, what OHS issues there are for small business, drugs and alcohol in the workplace, occupational violence, workplace bullying, quad bike safety, and of course, we also held a range of sessions for industries that were specific in terms of what's the future opportunities around how to ensure people are safe at work. As Cameron said, the launch was on the 4th of October. There were over 250 business leaders that came to hear Professor Alan Fells also talk about leadership in mental health. And today is a bit of a focus on that this morning, as well as a range of other topics. We've also heard from Cameron and Catherine throughout the month, and it's been fantastic to hear their stories and their journey around health and safety. And we'll look forward to hearing from Catherine in a minute. So it will be our flagship event in the future. There's no doubt that it absolutely gives us an opportunity to get out and about in quite a formal and official way, but really also at the local level to hear what's important to you, but importantly, how we can get the message of health and safety out into all workplaces in Victoria. It's also important for us to start to think about what that means for our future at WorkSafe and how we continue to be responsive to the needs of workplaces in Victoria. So Strategy 2030 is our new strategy and you may have heard a little bit about this over this month. And really our focus is because by 2030, it'll be a whole new ball game, not just for WorkSafe, but for all of us in this room. And amid a fairly rapidly changing world, there needs to be a very clear focus that reminds us to ask one question. Wherever, whenever, and however we work, how do we keep ourselves healthy, safe, and well? And it does ask WorkSafe, ourselves too, actually reflect and ask a very difficult question, as I'm sure many of you who know us well, how do we modernise WorkSafe? How do we do that, that regardless of the change, that we can continue, if not better, reach every employer and every worker in every community? But importantly, how do you also reach us? So we've got two simple goals at the heart of Strategy 2030. We want to build a much stronger prevention-led health and safety system. And we want to put the needs of people at the very heart of everything we do. 
So that's workers and employers, families and the community. So we've got to think differently about how we actually build the systems, processes and communicate that actually keeps us accountable for reminding us that people have to be at the centre of that. So for an injured worker and an employer going through the workers' compensation system in Victoria, it should be easy to navigate. It should be a supportive experience from the start of the claim to the end. Every inspection, every program, every treatment, every notice, every piece of communication needs to be designed to make it as easy as possible for people to understand our message and what our services are on offer. Collaboration and partnership must drive the future of our design and the delivery of programs. And they must be as useful as possible to you. Working more closely with our partners, we can start to think differently about how do we share ideas? How do we promote campaigns? How do we link up data and information with employers, unions, health professionals, community organisations, experts and workers across the state, but particularly how do we activate the community? And we want to activate it in a way to build a stronger health and safety ethos right across Victoria. So this means that we need to broaden our thinking around health and safety. So for 30 years, it's no surprise to anyone in this room that prevention has rested on the bedrock of constructive compliance. And that's a very important foundation. And that will not change in our future. But we do need to think about what it means to build on that. We need to go beyond compliance and prevention to also create cultures where we understand what it means to keep the well well. So it's keeping people not just safe, but well at work. And this will add an extra layer of proactive protection against illness and injury in the workplace. Wellness in the workplace also drives a healthier, more productive economy. And we also know that a strong economy is good for all of us and for everyone in the state. So creating a culture of healthy, safe and well workplaces calls on us with employers and employees right across the state with the community to understand what does this mean each day, day by day. By connecting more closely with our partners, we believe we can drive a new normal of community ownership and move health and safety to a higher ground. So with the right tools and a very clear philosophy, WorkSafe's transformation into a more responsive regulator, service provider, and community partner will keep us on track and therefore by 2030, we will have matured in our strategy. So I can assure you, we are not waiting till 2030 to deliver it. Prevention-led, partnership-driven, and above all, putting people first, will deliver the healthiest and safest workplaces in Australia. And so today actually keeps us grounded around what's one of the key issues that we are trying to address that are challenging workplaces right across Victoria, and that's mental health. So in the last financial year, what we saw through workers' compensation, that six months after lodging a claim, 45% of workers with a mental injury were not back at work, and that's compared to 18% with a physical injury. I think we all know that early intervention is absolutely key in terms of better outcomes for people with mental injury. And although we need to focus on this factor, we also need to understand better, so really create a much deeper understanding around what causes people to experience mental injury at work, and particularly how do we prevent this in the workplace. 
So it's an undeniable fact, I believe, that really a safe and supportive workplace is a productive one. So we've heard that and we understand that and there's significant evidence that supports that. So a place where workers are valued, where there is a concerted effort to bring out the best in every single person and where colleagues look out for each other has to be also part of our future. Dealing with mental health in the workplace, I'm not going to stand up here and say it's simple, it's a difficult and complex area. And I understand for most workplaces, we're trying to grapple with what's the best way forward to begin the conversation. And I also understand that unlike a physical injury, sometimes it's hard to recognise the early stages. And in many cases, it can be gradual over time and not all workplaces feel confident and comfortable about having the conversation. So what we recognise and what we see at WorkSafe is that it can happen to a teacher who's unable to cope with the stress of another year, an unruly class, or the relentless demands of parents. It can also happen to a nurse who's dealing with drug-affected patients or distraught family members. It may also happen to someone who's on a call centre, who day after day listens to people with complaints, who are unhappy about the service they receive, and can sometimes deliver vicious verbal threats and abuse. We also know it can happen to our frontline staff, to police and others, who actually seem impervious normally to the traumas that they have to face every day, but eventually, it can occur that they also feel that they cannot come into work. So a moment ago, you saw our uh, latest campaign from It's Never OK. And I agree with Cameron. Every time I see it, I think it's quite confronting. However, healthcare and aged care workers are twice as likely to any other employee in all other industries to lodge a claim for workers' compensation related to occupational violence and they're twice as likely to claim for a mental injury. It's hard to imagine that going to work every day, knowing that you could experience aggressive behaviour in the workplace. But behaviours like this not only cause physical injury to people, but they also can have long-lasting impacts in terms of the person's mental health. So as much as these are, it's a confronting campaign, it's also part of what our future might be. So this campaign has been developed in partnership with the Department of Health and Human Services. So it's an example for us about working across government. It importantly also comes with a number of tools and resources that aim to impact in health services both changing reporting and what the culture is around accepting behaviour like this from patients and the community. A lot of the tools are focused on how to actually minimise the risk. I'd also like to highlight, though, that the campaign, as much as it concentrates on what the employer's obligations are around safety of their staff, for employees not to tolerate that behaviour, it's also a call to action for the state to actually ask the community to understand the impact that behaviour has on people working in the front line. So some of us think, well, that's obvious in terms of our emergency services, but what can I do? What can I do every day? So I think that there's something, often we think what's the simple things that we can do to start a conversation and to change the impact in the workplace. I think all of us every day, including me, walks around the office and we ask people how they are. And of course, in that moment, we often say, I'm good, thanks, yep, good, no, life's good, busy day, but it's all fantastic, or we turn immediately to the weather. How do you know that someone's truly okay? I don't mean that you need to know everything that's going on in someone's head. And I don't think that you also need to know that everyone's going on with personal battles. But really, the point is, that if you don't notice someone is upset and you don't have a culture where you can reach out and have a conversation with somebody, then you might need to think how you can change that in the work. Now, we're incredibly supportive at WorkSafe around the Are You OK Day. I think it's a brilliant idea and it does change the conversation. But how can you actually say we can have that every day in the workplace? It's not just one day. 
The one day is reminding us to have it every day. It's actually having the courage to ask. And remember that you don't have to have the answers. This is about cultural change as much as it is about then thinking around what systems and processes you can put in place in the workplace to help people. And I can assure you, actually being a fantastic listener can be gold. That's one thing that people will appreciate, that people take the time and genuinely care. So, with that in mind, and hopefully some of you will take that away and throughout today hear much more what you can do in terms of mental health, I am going to introduce our next speaker, who will talk in, um, from personal experience around the experience of how to actually support people going through challenges in the workplace. And Cameron and Catherine have provided an enormous amount of insight from their experience in terms of what does it really mean to concentrate on well-being as part of health and safety and have been fantastic health and safety ambassadors. So thank you very much. So many of you will recognise Catherine from the television's Water Rats. I always say to Catherine that was one of my favourites. It's a generational thing. Rush, Wentworth, and currently the new Ch Channel 10 drama, Sisters. She's also a NIDA graduate, has won both Logie and AFI awards, and is a member of the Arts Wellbeing Collective, which aims to affect better mental health and wellbeing for the performing arts in Victoria. So please welcome Catherine McClements. Hi. Um, thanks for coming. Um, it's been my absolute pleasure to be the ambassador for Health and Safety Month. Not so much because I'm an expert on health and safety, far from it, but um, more that um, it allows me to chat about this, um, this project that I've been involved in, which is the, um, the Arts Wellbeing Collective. Um, it's a pilot project that happened just for one year, but it was uh, an initiative of Art Centre Melbourne, which I'm a trust member, and also um, a charity called Entertainment Assist, uh, whose major donor is um, Jeannie Pratt. I don't know if you know who she is. She runs a production company. She's been a, a great supporter of the arts um, through her time here on Earth. Um, and uh, it's, it's the Wellbeing Coll uh, Collective is an effort to um, support and destigmatize those who are dealing with um, mental health issues in, in, in my community and also to just um, generally encourage well-being um, uh, in the arts community generally. Um, the project was la launched last year and it was launched on the back of a uh, report um, that came out from the University of Victoria about um, mental health in the arts and entertainment industry. It was the um, most extensive study of arts and entertainment industry workers ever in the world. And um, it had the catchy title of the Mental Health and Wellbeing Entertainment Industry Workers. It, um, oh, hang on, I've gone back. I knew that, there we go. There it is. And the... Um, the findings were, were pretty disturbing. Um, we had anxiety 10 times greater than the general population, we had depression five times greater, and we had suicide and contemplation of suicide two times greater than the general community. Um, it's a shocking um, result, and, but I must say, in some ways, I wasn't surprised at these sort of figures. I mean, I've been an actor now for, for 30, or well, more than 30 years, um, and, you know, when I was training back in the 80s at drama school, there was no talk about looking after yourself in the industry I was about to embark on, about mental health. Um, I was a very well-supported student. I was 17, went to Sydney. You know, rents were cheap, had a fantastic apartment in Coogee overlooking the water. Nothing really seems to be wrong. Um, but I developed these terrible debilitating uh, things called stomach migraines, which was completely a result of the anxiety leading up to an opening night. Um, the only support I got from NIDA was uh, make sure you keep $20 under your uh, pillow because in case you have to get the taxi to the hospital in the middle of the night. And it wasn't because they didn't care about me. It was because there was no sort of formulation of, of, of how we deal with this very stressful and anxious making and, and very competitive environment we were about to enter into. 
And, and my very first job that I ever got was, it was quite a high profile and um, very expensive film at the time. And of course it was no surprise, on the, on, on the eve of my first filming day, I ended up in hospital with this very thing, on a drip with very anxious producers at my side. And it, I was lucky in a way that, that my career continued after that because it's a very expensive thing for someone who's making a film at the time. Um, I think things have changed a little and um, the Wellbeing Collective is, is, is part of that change. There's also, in my industry, a slight mystique of the, of the tortured artist. You know, we sometimes feel in a way that we have to have some sort of mental instability to be a great artist. And I, look, I don't know if it's true. I certainly tried to, to hide up the fact that I was a very well-balanced um, suburban girl when I started out, but the... The truth is about my industry is that we do embrace um, and, and need those people who can, who can delve into their deepest emotions and, and darkest thoughts and, and we rely on the misfits and the, and the egomaniacs and the, and, and the challenging. Um, so you don't want to deny them access because we need them. But the thing is, we send those people out into this industry that has incredible highs. I mean, when you get a job, when you get a role, it, it, there's nothing like it. And, 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 and when you get great reviews or a great response from the audience, or you know you've put in a great performance with, with your colleagues on stage, it's a really fantastic feeling. But then there's incredible lows when you don't get the role, that you have put your heart and soul in, that you've, that you've worked so hard. And this happens week after week as you audition for parts. You're rejected constantly. Then, then you get bad reviews or you get a bad response. And then the show, uh, these are very short contracts, so often the show ends in three months and all those intense friendships and that experience of performing, that energy that it gives you, disappears. It just doesn't exist anymore. And with those three-month contracts, the threat of unemployment or unemployment is always just part of your life. It's, it's a very stressful workplace because you're always leading up to an opening night, so there's always this sort of anxiety of performance in that way. And, and so it's, it's, it's a difficult world if, if you're dealing with those things to, to sort of live in un unsupported. And I must say there's one other thing that's, that's really come about. It wasn't really part of my world, but it certainly is now, and that's social media for people in the public eye. I mean, when I was, a, a, you know, I was on a, a quite... You know, Water Rats was, was a very popular show. I was, was very well known, and I was, you know, looked at in the street and whispered about and called out to, and, and I felt very uncomfortable and I felt very vulnerable, I suppose. Most people are absolutely beautifully lovely, but now and then, you know, I had instances of stalkers and, you know, there were some odd pieces, but I would not trade that for the sort of stuff that people are dealing with in the social sphere now. The sort of... I would just say in the Wentworth girls, the, the, the stuff that people are writing about them, the threats, the vitriol, that is slightly addictive to read, I think, um, but um, it doesn't necessarily leave you with a good feeling because no matter how much you read good things, the things that stay with you are the bad things that you can't get out of your head. Um, so I always imagined that in a way we survived this world because of the sort of camaraderie of actors. We all understood what it was like, we could, we could all support and help each other out. But the thing about this report, um, it did concentrate on not just performers, but the industry as a whole. It looked from everyone from roadies to, to ballet dancers to, to um, technicians to producers, everyone that was involved in the live cultural life of, of Victoria. And what I found revealing is 50% of those people that were surveyed found that they were working in a bullying, sexist, racist and or toxic environment. And that there was no way that they could look into their community to help if um, they were feeling mentally fragile. No one of the backstage crew, that's the technicians and the support staff when they're putting on a show, sought any help for mental health issues, yet 50% of them had thought about or attempted suicide. Only one in three people in my community have sought help for mental health issues. And so when statistics like this um, come out, it's just no way that we can't feel culpable, that, that nothing can be done. And, and when I was 
thinking about this talk, I mean, I have certainly witnessed terrible bullying and very nasty behaviour in, in the workplace. Televisions thrown, people shouted at. And I was wondering why I allowed that behaviour to go ahead. And I think it's, it's slightly to do with the mystique of, of the artistic expression. I mean, who knows why an actor puts in a good performance? No one can tap into it. And so the sort of workplace is a little bit more sort of allowing of certain behaviours because it may just spark some creative um, genius. And also the, 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 the power of the uh, high-profile celebrity is really not to be messed at because, you know, the financial success of a show really sometimes rests squarely on their shoulders. And um, so they're given a lot of leeway. Also, a director is, is, is allowed all sorts of disturbing, in a way, behaviour because it's their vision that drives a piece and so everyone is, 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 is allowing them to do stuff because we all need what, they, what they're going to give an audience. Um, and, and then again, contracts are often three months. So it's over in a, in, in a matter of weeks and, and we just allow it to happen and then, you know, then it's a good story to tell your friends, certainly if it hasn't happened to you but you've witnessed it, over a drink uh, after it's all sort of uh, done and dusted. But when I read these sort of statistics, I realised that nothing can't be done. Something has to um, move. And at the time at Art Centre Melbourne, um, the CEO, uh, Claire Spencer, noticed that there were certain trends in her workplace. Trends is, I think, that's what the trade call it. And it's sort of disturbing behaviour. I think like, like um, anxieties, uh, a lot of absenteeism, which is often a sign of a stressed workplace. And then there was a very awful suicide in the food and beverage arm of Art Centre Melbourne's workforce. And she felt compelled to sort of find out what was, what was happening. And she wondered um, if it was just her workforce or if it really was, uh, as this report suggested, an industry-wide situation. So she, she emailed all the people who find uh, uh, Art Centre Melbourne their home, and that's um, like Australian Opera, Australian Ballet, Melbourne Theatre Company, Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. She emailed all those guys and said, is, is this something that you're experiencing as well? And she said it was the quickest response to an email she has ever had. Everyone responded, yes, this is what they were feeling, but they really didn't um, know how to deal with it. And um, so one of the key recommendations um, for uh, the, um, the response to this mental health um, report was that something should be developed that's sort of in-house, that speaks the language of the people that are dealing with, something specific for our entertainment industry. And Arts Centre Melbourne is the largest arts organisation in um, Victoria. And Claire thought, you know, with leadership comes responsibility. And the great thing also is that because it's such a large organisation, it has a very sophisticated HR team. So she called on Sonia Lindsay, who was heading that team at the time, to sort of try and put together something in response to what was happening. And, and Sarah was working with a uh, psychologist, Michael, I can't remember if it's Carr Grieg or Grieg Carr. Anyway, I think he's on the radio, actually. He was working at the time with Art Centre Melbourne, um, dealing with a, a transsexual uh, worker who was transitioning, and she had some very specific problems um, to deal with in the workplace. And uh, so she... Um, she sought his support and fortunately he at that time was working with a student of his who was a provisional psychologist and her name was Greta Bradman, sorry, Greta Bradman and she, um, she's one of Australia's leading sopranos as, as well and so she had intimate knowledge of the industry. So together they formed this team and um, Claire said, look, if you can get, say, 15 arts organisations to sign up, we can focus resources on this. And I think as we speak, we've got like 115 arts organisations that signed up to the Wellbeing Collective. And so um, WorkSafe came on board, Vic Health came on board. And the thing that Arts Centre Melbourne did, which I thought was really great, was they approached um, the Mariner Group. Um, you probably know the Regent Theatre. They run um, some of the biggest, biggest theatres in, in, in Melbourne. I think there's about five. So they're the big commercial operators of theatre um, 
The Mariner Group and Arts Centre Melbourne have had a very scratchy relationship, to say the least, over the years. You know, that, that there's that fight between commercial operators and government-supported uh, theatre, which is Arts Centre Melbourne. And, um, but Claire was very keen that this should be a joint exercise, both commercial uh, and non-profit, because otherwise it was slightly tokenistic, the enterprise. And um, so they fronted up to Jason Mariner, and to his absolute credit, he not only put a huge amount of money towards this pilot project, he also joined the advisory committee, which I'm part of, and, and encouraged his workers to be, to be involved. So, so the collective was born, and um, it focused on workshops, training, resources, and, you know, which is common now, a dedicated website. Everything was free to those who signed up, and um, when looking at the workshops, which was really the heart of, of the collective, um, Sonia was saying that a few things were really important. One thing was that they had to be um, entertaining. Um, they had to be fun, they had to be interactive. The idea was that no one spoke for longer than three minutes before the audience was in, included in the experience. And there had to be a certain amount of production values because they did understand that it was the entertainment industry, so they had to live up to that name. Um, there was a certain amount of rigour that had to, uh, it had to be backed by, you know, in rigour in industrial relations, but also um, rigour um, with evidence based mental health. I mean, the thing about mental health is that you have to um, look at a holistic health um, plan. And uh, I think that there's a trap of falling into certain jargons and certain unsubstantiated um, uh, health um, ideas that, that can sometimes come up. And they didn't want to fall into that trap. Um, there had to be a common language. Um, so that you were speaking the language of the people that you were talking to. And um, they were very keen on tapping into influences. So there were workshops specifically designed for um, industry managers and leaders because in order to um, create a, a long-term and, and sector-wide change, they felt that they needed to be included in the, in, in the, in the work. Um, so... Um, it's been an incredibly successful year. Most workshops were completely full and they were sometimes redone so we could deal with the overflow. Uh, a roadshow was put together. They went to Warrnambool and Horsham and Bendigo and Wangaratta and Geelong. Um, uh, due to demand, those special sessions were created. Um, one uh, particular to do with Indigenous mental health we have a big uh, community in the arts community, indigenous community. And um, the other, which was close to my heart, is they went into VCA, which is a training institute, Victorian College of the Arts, to, to talk to the students there and, and help with workshops for teachers. Um, the program is undergoing review at the moment to see, um, to see its effectiveness um, and where it will go from here. Um, it's, it's sort of a victim of its own success. Um, I think now Arts Centre Melbourne wonder if it's really the organisation that can contain such a far-reaching idea. Um, but, you know, things are being tossed around at the moment. And, it, you know, it's, I'm so incredibly proud of this. It was something that wasn't easy, I suppose, when you look into the community that I'm part of. You think, how, how are you going to tackle this? And we knew it was just one step and it wasn't a quick and easy fix. I don't think it ever will be. But, um, but that step was taken. And, and I hope it leads into a run in the end. Um, but I thought, uh, just to finish off, I'd, I'd show you this video that we created at the beginning of the launch of the program. Um, just to, it's, it doesn't have the same values as the first video, I must say. But anyway, it's nice. One of the things that good mental health does, I think it really allows for freedom of creativity, which I think is such a positive thing, you know, for artists, and not only the people on the stage, but the people backstage as well, because we all become so, you know, invested and have such a vested interest in making these things live, making them spontaneous, 
and in not being bound up with, you know, what ifs or if onlys that might be going on with, you know, mental health difficulties or, you know, just those, those moments of sort of being caught in the past or in the future. There's something that is very liberating, I think. I, I think it's kind of essential for the type of work that we do. I think because of the, the big gaps that we can sometimes have in between work, there's no consistency, it's ever changing. And just when you think that you're kind of on a bit of a roll, then, then the break and the silence comes. The hours are irregular, you're away from your family, you're away from your friends, it can actually be really lonely. You need to really think about that and compensate for that in, in other ways. If you're worried about anything, you should always try and um, take corrective action for that. The, the best way to treat it is exactly like it's a, a physical kind of condition. Certainly as a singer, if there's something wrong with my throat, I go to the doctor because I need to be in full uh, command of my um, faculties and capabilities to do what I do and the same thing applies mentally. And I think the best place to start is probably with your friends or the, the network that you've set up around you or someone you feel close to or someone you feel comfortable to, with. I like to meditate as often as I can. I'd love to say that I do it daily but I don't but it's definitely a tool that I use and um, try to practice as often as possible. I was never given any clue as to how to maintain mental health or, or how to um, help other people, you know, um, maintain that. And through my career, I've seen lots of people with serious mental issues and really not known how to help, I suppose. And I'm hoping with this sort of project that it gives us all the equipment and all the language and all the tools to, to sort of support each other and, and, and enable each other to keep the, sort of that, that healthy aspect and outlook. I, I hope out of the collective uh, there is a bit more clarity and a bit more um, accessibility, I guess, to mental health aid for our, for our industry. Um, uh, and not just uh, performers, uh, particularly uh, people like crew and uh, people behind the scenes who maybe don't get the same credit or the same recognition for the jobs that they do, which are you know, supremely important for any project to work. This is such a, it's such a collaborative industry that uh, I guess everyone needs to be as close to their, to their A game as possible and, and mental health is one of those things that is so common and it's such a it had been such a stigmatised kind of thing, mental, mental health, and I think we, we are fortunate enough to work in an industry that uh, I think a lot of that stigma is actually uh, self-imposed. And the more we can feel free to be able to actually talk about mental health issues and seek help for mental health issues, the more we can actually collaborate with our you know, co-workers to make the best product we possibly can. Thank you for that, Catherine, and Claire as well. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, Catherine, your comments. So we have worked together now a couple of times throughout this month. Uh, the biggest one, even your, your comments in, in the video there, the big ones are for me as well. A lot of us just don't know what to say, how to help, where to begin. Um, and it's really important just to hear that through a collaborative approach and getting together and creating that culture that you mentioned, Claire, that you can just start the ball rolling, whatever industry it is, entertainment industry for me personally within the sporting industry, just getting those little improvements day by day then creates that culture where people do feel a bit more comfortable to, uh, to talk up about whatever problems they may be going through. So thank you again, uh, Catherine, for that. As I mentioned right at the start, uh, there is the opportunity to ask some questions today and uh, hopefully some of you have uh, sent in some questions and they are coming up on my screen now which is uh, good to hear, uh, good to see. Um, hashtag HS month or text in as I mentioned and uh, I'm going to fire a few of these at both you Claire and Catherine. Um, they're I think going to come up on the screen so uh, let's hope. There we go, it's all working beautifully. Well done to uh, everyone who's got this working. 
First question, uh, Catherine, is the Wellbeing Collective going national and do other states have similar programs in place? Um, the answer is um, no other state have similar programs. In It was a, a Victorian uh, initiative. Other states were very interested, um, but, uh, but we weren't funded really to, to, to move outside Victoria. Um, that's one of the questions about what is the future of this, um, this collective? And it's something that I think could really do with being a nationwide thing. Um, yeah, and there certainly have been um, people wanting that, but we'll see. Just to continue on with your theme, Catherine, uh, this next question, specifically to actors. Um, how, how do actors address mental health implications of playing Disturbed characters from uh, Darren from University of Melbourne. Thanks for that, Darren. Oh, there's a lot of disturbed characters. They make good drama, <laughs> I must say. <laughs> I look, I mean, you know, um, that's part of our job, I think, you know, to play certain characters. Um, I have certainly done that, and I find it actually quite um, liberating. And uh, it actually, you know, if I'm shouting at someone on stage, I have to shout less in life. But there have been instances, I think it's, it's sort of um, uh, that, that I'm aware of, of where it's sort of a, on stage you have to fall in love with someone or you have to be obsessed with someone or that, that the borders are crossed. Uh, and there's been a few instances where I think it's very murky, um, that world, about what we allow people to do outside um, the stage and outside the rehearsal room. And it's happened a couple of times. And I still think, and talking with the collective, there's been a lot of stage managers who have to deal with that. They're the front line of, of, of dealing with issues of, of people who won't go on stage or can't go on stage or who, are, who have problems with other actors. And they don't understand. They're not trained. They, don't, they haven't got any psychology degrees. Yet they have to deal with it day after day. And that's one thing that the um, Wellbeing Collective was was dealing with. But for me personally, playing a disturbed character helps my mental health. <laughs> <laughs> Just settles you back down, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, it does. Um, for either of you here, I think this, uh, this question um, from the hashtag, how can we address mental health at work when the surrounding community is unsupportive? What strategies are best for that? I think that part of addressing mental health at work is to create a supportive community. So I think, um, I'm not sure exactly what it means by surrounding communities, whether it's other parts of the workplace, but as I said, I think it does take a bit of courage to begin that conversation around, do we think we actually have a mentally healthy workplace? So I think often when particularly from our perspective, it's very easy for us to see the physical hazards. So if there's a tripping hazard, um, guards on machinery, um, manual handling, and I don't want to deny that we still have a very big focus on um, those issues. But what we can't see, what's not something that we can actually tangibly see, we often then don't have the conversation about. So what we're really trying to say, and I think what Catherine's talked in a bit of detail is, by actually naming it and having the conversation, hopefully you're creating an environment that will become the supportive community in your workplace, and that you will start to learn what tools are available, what um, supports are available. And I know at the moment there's an awful lot out there. If you Google services, because I hear um, employers and workers say this on a regular basis. So we have created um, some information at WorkSafe where we are trying to synthesise some of those tools. So how can you assess what your workplace is like and what kind of um, information you can provide people. So again, once you start to have the conversation, hopefully you'll create that supportive community. And I think the Wellbeing Collective is an interesting example of that. Claire, the end of your answer there may answer this one, in fact, um, on the SMS. How do WorkSafe or employers aim to measure a well workplace, as you mentioned in your speech? Are they the tools that you're talking about there at the end? Yeah, I think that there's firstly a process to even understand um, how well is your workplace. 
And so again, how do you assess that so that we do have some tools and we are about to launch a new website um, soon that will provide more information. But we also have, I think Catherine mentioned Vic Health, and we've got a, a collaboration at WorkSafe with Vic Health and Superfriend, and we do have a website at Leading Well Vic. Um, and that provides a number of case studies, but also some tools around those assessments. Um, to know whether you've got a well workplace. So looking at those key questions. I also think that there are opportunities that think about how do you measure it. And Catherine and I were actually talking before around the evaluation of the um, collective and uh, trying to get our head around how do you measure that it's had an impact? And how do you measure that the things that you're doing have an impact? I think again in mental health, don't be quick to think it's not having the right impact. So the first thing I would say is that by talking about it, in fact, you might be more aware of it, and you might then feel as though it's a bigger issue than what it was, and maybe you shouldn't have raised it, but what you're creating is an environment where people are talking about it, that it's a safe environment, I think that over time, once you do that, then you should start to think about, so what does a well environment now look like for us as a workplace? How do we know that people are becoming healthier and are feeling better by coming to work because of the um, excitement around what you're actually offering your people? Can I just say there was another one that I hope people might go on the website. We had our awards recently, and um, one of the uh, firms that... Um, was a runner-up in our um, Work um, Safe Awards was VOC, and they're an IT software company. And listening to them speak about their um, initial uh, mission of when they set up their business was that they their number one priority as an organisation was um, we want to be the most mentally healthy workplace in Victoria. So that was their first place. And it came from the people who set up the business of having some personal experience. And I'd be very surprised if not everyone in the room knows someone or has heard about someone or in your family or yourself, you have not experienced um, an issue with mental health. And so again, thinking about not that your personal life is your workplaces, you know, trying to get inside your privacy, but we don't leave our personal life at the door when we come to work every day. So we bring all of us when we come to work. And so it's really creating an environment in the workplace to have that conversation. But there are a number of resources. Um, and I hope today, um, through a number of the sessions, you'll hear more about those resources. Flowing on uh, about those resources, Catherine, this one for you on the SMS. Does the collective allow your people to self-access using, self-assess, sorry, not access, assess using online tools and report on their wellbeing to EAP or other health professionals? I, I don't think they do. I, that's an interesting, a really interesting idea. No, I don't think that that website does. It offers just more resources and tools for people, but not the self-assessment. Um, something I'll take back. Another one uh, to you, Catherine, uh, yeah. again on the uh, SMS, uh, and obviously extremely important, doesn't fall under the category, I suppose, of workers uh, sometimes, unless they are employed, uh, and depending how old they are, I suppose. But how do you, Catherine, how do you address the mental health of minors in the arts industry? Does your project address this category of workers, given how vulnerable they can be? Look, this is a really big question for me. Um, I'm very uncomfortable about children working in the entertainment industry. I don't know why. I, I've worked with a lot of um, kids who play my children on screen, and um, I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I just don't like it. I, I find that they get too much attention, um, both at school and um, on set, and that it's a, a stressful thing that they have to come up with. I, I believe, sort of, in a way, the experience of culture and arts for children should be about... Um, something that's uh, sort of not quantifiable in a way that's just part of being a human being and part of being a child growing up. So I do find this an issue, um, just in my personal, not everyone feels that. And it's sometimes not something that straight away um, happens, it's something that happens in the long term. It's very, uh, it's often to do with the parents, 
who, who push their children. A lot of them don't. A lot of children, um, and I have some very close friends who started acting when they were eight and now are producers and it's been their life career. That does happen. Um, but there's a lot of instances where children are just are so excited about being sort of famous, I suppose, and their parents similarly. Um, so uh, there is no self-assessment for, for that sort of thing. It's, it's up to the families, I suppose. But I think it's a long-term thing that sometimes can kick in further down the track. Um, I think it's a really good point and something maybe the Wellbeing Collective should, should look at it too if it, if it continues. But that's just my personal, you know, gripe. <laughs> A couple more questions uh, from the SMS and the, uh, the social media hashtag. Um, there are lots of questions coming in, so I really appreciate all the questions. Apologies, I will say now the fact we won't be able to get to every single one of them. Uh, Claire, this one for you, as it comes up on the screen from the SMS again. How can WorkSafe improve its agent systems and processes to better support and assist injured workers with long-term physical injuries causing secondary mental health issues. From Joe Tedesco, thanks for that, Joe. Yeah, look, I get asked this quite a lot, actually. So, and I have to say that um, absolutely the agents are our responsibility at WorkSafe. So the first thing is, I absolutely appreciate that at times you may not experience a service that you expect or that you think is done in a respectful way. And that's absolutely our responsibility at WorkSafe to make sure that we continue to assess that. I think that what we're really trying to say in our future is to say that as much as there is a process where people are injured and that they have to lodge a claim, we recognise that that is a quite complicated process to navigate and that workers' compensation is not easily understood by pretty much most people that interact with it other than the people that are dealing with it all the time. So we hear not just from an injured worker, but we also hear from employers, but importantly, we also hear from treaters that they don't quite understand the differences and the nuances and why we need information. So we absolutely recognise that particularly people who are in the workers' compensation system for a long period of time, in fact, can actually become quite unwell through the system. So it's not just the system, there's multiple parts of it, but we absolutely recognise it needs to improve. So part of our future, and we've started to pilot some of this at the moment across our um, insurers, which are referred to as agents, but they're the insurers, around how do we actually offer a service to someone who might need a tailored service to their individual needs based on their individual workplace and the complexities or intricacies of their workplace, all based on the interaction between them, their workplace and their treater. So you may have heard some um, examples of mobile case management where we actually, um, the agents actually provide a specialist case manager to go out to you, both at home or in the workplace and work with you and your employer and your treater. Firstly, to get things done really quickly where we can, so you can understand the system really um, clearly. But importantly, if there are some complexities or there are challenges or it's getting hard to understand what you need to do in terms of the system, then absolutely help you navigate the system more easily. Now, this is very small, a bit like the pilot for <laughs> wellbeing. We're trialling this, but we've um, currently, I think, over 700 um, injured workers, and this year we're looking to hopefully double that in terms of an approach, and we're learning as we go around how to do things differently. So part of our future at WorkSafe is to give things a go, to actually stand up different ways of working, and if it actually has the right impact, it actually is providing benefit, that we actually get good feedback that it is the way in terms of our future, then we need to start to work out, so how do we actually broaden this out? Whereas I think in the past, we would wait and sort of roll things out right across the state and you would all, again, get the same service. So you might think it's taken us a while, but we've recognised that some workplaces, indiv individuals, need a different way of interacting with us. Can I just say the second thing is that we are launching a new website, because I know our website is very difficult. 
We will, and I can hear some, yes, those of you who know the website, it's very difficult. Uh, part of the new website is for us to create a platform where eventually we are hoping in the very uh, near future, you'll be able to interact with us also online. Because we also appreciate that some of you would prefer a more real-time response where you can interact with us like you interact with any service um, in the state. And so we are also working on that as well. Last question, and this one is to you, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, just the last one on the, uh, on the collective. How have the Arts Centre been able to measure the impact of the wellbeing collective? Yeah, that's, that's what we were talking about. It's very difficult. At the moment, we're undergoing a review of the last year. Um, and Tonks is doing it. He used to, used to be um, general manager of um, Melbourne Theatre Company. She now runs GPAC. So um, she's very well experienced to sort of understand that. I think there's been a huge amount of response from people who, who have come, some incredible letters, um, and I think that that will be part of it. Um, but it's in the process, and as we said, how do you, mm. how do you say whether it was successful or not? Um, I, yeah, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's reading those letters and, and seeing individually how fee people feel after they have been to one of those sessions, how they feel they can open up, how they can talk, and how they can then find a way through what they're feeling. But um, I think it probably will be deeper than that, the, um, the results. Unfortunately, as I said, lots of questions coming in. We didn't have time to ask them all. I apologise for all of those great questions coming in. Anyone who wants to know more, please, if you see any of the WorkSafe staff around there, please go and ask some questions, uh, really important ones there. But if you could all just put your hands together for our two speakers, Claire, Amy, and Catherine McClements. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Good on you. Really appreciate your words today from both of you and, uh, and the time that you uh, both put into uh, making people safer and well in the workplace. Uh, we're going to have a little break now. It's just gone 10 o'clock, two past 10, so I'm only a couple of minutes behind, so I won't get in trouble too much. <laughs> we're going to be back in here uh, in about 15 minutes' time for our next speaker, Lindsay Tanner. So go and grab a quick coffee or tea, bathroom break, and then back in here in about 15 minutes' time.